presents Money in the Bank. WWE figuring that the new Mission Impossible movie is right around the corner, so they make an MI-inspired logo in production for the build-up to Money in the Bank. This just made the mission feel more possible than impossible. Also, scene does not contain Tom Cruise. Guess you could say it was impossible to get him to do this intro, am I right? Okay, I'm sorry. Won't lie, some of the animation work on this is actually pretty cool and amazing. Looking like a wrestler's soul just left his body upon falling. Wait, are we referencing the new Insidious movie coming up with the soul leaves the body tactic? Two films we're referencing here. Where's Indiana Jones next? Cody Rhodes has been fighting with Brock Lesnar the last few months and figures that he has some time to kill while he awaits for the inevitable third match at SummerSlam. Sad to realize that Dominic Mysterio is just someone to pass the time with, the heat he has with the crowd. We still the ones. Right? I only kicked you in the face twice and finally had enough of your bullshit, but we're still a team, right? We're still good? At that rate, Jimmy Uso deserved to get spiked by Solo Sokoa. Money in the Bank is really loving the movie references here. Mission Impossible, Insidious, and now Captain America. Damn, the downside of recreating the stage setup from this year's backlash is the lack of opening pyrotechnics even though they launch pyro from the ceiling. Also, another big shame is the absence of the drone used to enter the arena from outside like at Backlash. I can only assume the O2 arena doesn't have the same luxury as the one in Puerto Rico did, but still. Also, also, holy shit, this show is practically four hours long. I really hope WWE isn't traveling back to the 2018 to 2020 days where every single pay-per-view is four hours with endless matches on the card. That was a huge mistake. Butch is non-Pyro Pyro. Wonder if he is done dealing with that. Yeah, I know, I gotta stop making all these puns. I'm done. I'm done. Wait, fuck! Whose bright idea was it to put the tiny ladders on the stage? Is it because the stage itself is tiny? Hornswoggle making a comeback here or something? First Butch had non-Pyro Pyro, and now Shinsuke Nakamura has non-Pyro Pyro. We are one non-Pyro Pyro away from renaming this The Ryback Show. Welcome to WWE Money in the Bank, The Ryback Show. In on any world and that is why I would never wear items on my jacket that stick out because they always get stuck on the ropes when I go inside. <laughs> now you're just trying to get under my skin, aren't you? Well, joke's on you. I don't lose my shit that easily. Except if Hulu's involved. <laughs> WWE's camera crew switched to this one despite the fact that LA Knight is still making his way to the ring and hasn't finished with his own entrance. What a bunch of dicks. Is Logan Paul a megastar? Yes. Is he one of the most impressive celebrity turned wrestlers who ever stepped into a WWE ring? Absolutely. But adding him into this Money in the Bank ladder match without so much as a qualification felt like one of the most random things to add to the show. Doesn't really need to be in the match despite his stardom. Logan Paul getting Royal Rumble 2023 flashbacks. After that went down earlier this year, how did he not expect to get his ass whooped by everyone else competing in the match he didn't earn? And remember, there are no pinfalls. We are on the 14th annual Money in the Bank pay-per-view event, and for likely more than the 14th time, we got the commentators reminding us how the rules of a Money in the Bank ladders match is supposed to go. First ladder introduced is too small to reach the prize cliche. Logan Paul must have watched my videos all these years and want to be the guy I'd send for that cliche. Guess his wish finally came true. Also, there are literally Jeff Hardy-sized ladders on the outside of the ring, yet nobody decides to bring those into the ring to reach the briefcase. They're really not being the brightest wrestlers tonight, are they? Get Butch takes a DDT from LA Knight and briefly turns into Shawn Michaels from SummerSlam 2005 by flipping everywhere after landing on the canvas. Crown Jewel, Royal Rumble. Either Logan Paul doesn't like heights, or WWE always added gravity effects to the ladders that makes the wrestlers slowly climb it no matter how fast they were going a second ago. What is that, a, a club? This is not the first time wrestlers used a cricket bat as a weapon in WWE, yet Michael Cole somehow still doesn't know what it is. And how the hell do you not know what cricket is anyway? It's about time an Englishman did something good with a cricket bat. Damien Priest actually stops and listens to Logan Paul after the latter told him to stop and listen. And he even agrees to briefly team up with him too. Did Logan promise him a lifetime supply of Prime? <laughs> you couldn't have just done that earlier when Logan was actually vulnerable and asked you to team up with him? Every time LA Knight gets in the it's one thing to aim how you're going to fly through a ladder, but Ricochet literally one-shots it out of luck and it succeeds. That's even more impressive. Logan Paul! If Logan gets up, he has my ultimate respect. Yeah, because nobody has ever got back up from a punch to the face from Damian Priest at that height. It's literally impossible. Look at a suplex Paul, but it Butch was among those who were kicking Logan Paul's ass when the match begun, but the moment Damian is about to connect a suplex through a ladder, Butch draws the line, thus preventing a potentially awesome moment from happening. You would expect. Oh! 
I was about to say haha the ladder didn't break, but then realized that Damien Priest suffered even worse than he would have had the ladder actually broke, especially with that smacking sound. What a brutal moment. <laughs> KSI and the crowd likely tried to whack Logan Paul with a prime bottle as a form of retaliation for Logan putting him through a table at WrestleMania. Up on his shoulders. What in the hell happened there? Was Shinsuke Nakamura trying to hit the GTS on LA Knight but decided too late to put him down and hit a DDT instead? That was a weird moment. I guess ladders really don't want to break tonight. That and Ricochet nearly missed both his targets entirely in that 450 splash. Ceiling cam. And no one's got eyes on Priest! Except for LA Knight, who's literally watching Damian Priest climb the ladder to the briefcase and is doing absolutely nothing about it for almost 10 seconds. It's like he doesn't even want to win. Given the crowd reaction, he'd be the only one aside from his opponents. Do not get a moment's peace. Ricochet must have thought Butch was going to connect a bulldog and fell forward without actually being put down. Been quite a few miscommunications in this match, haven't there? Butch definitely had a defining moment with that picture-perfect moonsault from near the top of that big ladder. Great match to kick off the show so far. LA Knight doesn't seem to have a good strategy here, as he brings a second ladder into the ring and starts climbing it, despite the fact that the briefcase is far away from his ladder, and the one underneath the briefcase has an unoccupied side. Shinsuke Nakamura and Santos Escobar literally stay in this position for nearly 20 seconds because both Ricochet and Logan Paul missed their cue to jump onto the ladders, thus creating an awkward moment where we are waiting for something to happen. Surprised it took three attempts before LA Knight realized he could have just pushed the ladder over to topple Logan and Ricochet. He's hit from over the <laughs> Scary and cool as that moment was, it sadly had a lot of miscommunication and poor timing as a result of the ropes. Really believe Ricochet and Logan Paul should have practiced that more because this nearly killed them both. Butch is gonna win money in the bank. Voice crack and all, Michael Cole just jinxed Butch's momentum by prematurely declaring his Money in the Bank victory. Better hope Butch doesn't go after your fingers too. LA Knight was a huge favor by the audience indeed, but in terms of build up to the show, Damian Priest absolutely was the right choice here. Take that as you will, but he's risen to new heights since his fight with Bad Bunny at Backlash two months ago. With the tension rising in the Judgment Day, this just became much more exciting. Congratulations to Damian on the win. And Bud Light. With literally every match replay, Michael Cole has to promote Bud Light out the ass and it's so annoying. Poor Michael. It only goes up from here. Poor choice of words from Wade Barrett. Great Money in the Bank ladder match and it only goes up from here. Right as the Women's Tag Team Championship match is up next. And unless this match somehow tops the performance of that previous ladder match, I highly doubt the momentum is only going up from here. Even prior to what's inevitably going to happen in this match, you can already see that Shayna Baszler misses her own theme song, living in Ronda Rousey's shadow even by music. There's something I wanted to point out about this. First off, good on Ronda and Shayna to unify the main roster tag team titles with the NXT ones. That being said, you mean to tell me that they won both sets of titles and didn't at least get a new design as the undisputed tag team champions? Or one holds the main roster title while the other holds the NXT title? These two friends forever! Michael Cole was actually trying to warn us about what Shayna Baszler is about to do to Ronda Rousey by emphasizing the words friends forever. Someone grab that Michael Cole holds a sign meme for me. Your favorites don't automatically get to win. Jeez, Wade, you didn't have to rub it in the faces of the LA Knight fans out there after the previous match. Partially toward Labrum, Rotator Cup. I honestly think Michael Cole is overdoing it with the explanation of Liv Morgan's injuries. Even partial tears on both the labrum and the rotator cuff would not have Liv Morgan back in the ring within a single month, especially if they happened at the same time. Just say it was something minor, no need to be over dramatic about this. She shocked the world, cashed in. I wouldn't exactly say Liv Morgan shocked the world by cashing in her briefcase the same night she won it last year because that's been the most recurrent theme in women's Money in the Bank history. Tell me when I'm telling lies. Early on, Shayna Baszler manages to trap Liv Morgan's arm under her foot to perform a signature stomp to the arm. But considering Liv suffered literally no damage in the first 10 seconds of this match, why is Shayna choosing to pose around before the connection? Believes that her and Raquel are best team in WWE. Well, they have little to no competition that can argue that, so not exactly a brag in motion. Now, if they crushed at least 10 other teams, then yes, they are. Well, Liv Morgan looked to throw Shayna into the corner, then let go halfway across the apron, which started a race to the other side of the ring. Liv wins that one. Well, to be fair, they technically... Oh! And a devastating kick to the air as well. Wins a quick race, then kicks an invisible ghost haunting the O2 arena. Raquel Wright infringement. Definitely the most dangerous. 
woman. Michael Cole quickly looked up to make sure Ronda Rousey couldn't hear him refer to Shayna Baszler as the most dangerous woman in WWE over her. Definitely fueled Shayna's eventual rage. Unbeknownst to Ronda Rousey, Liv Morgan quickly put a metal plate underneath her fur-covered leggings before this match so that she would not be affected by the ankle lock. Imagine if Liv is yelling in pain out loud but laughing her ass off on the inside. Although, after years of utilizing the ankle lock, why doesn't Ronda sit down and hyperextend Liv's leg like Kurt Angle did? Hell, Kurt's the one who taught her to use that hole too! Fuck on! Good on Raquel Rodriguez to break up that double submission, but the way she shoved over Ronda Rousey, she almost caused Liv to break her own leg. Couldn't it just kicked Ronda in the head or something? I'm sorry, but no. Shayna Baszler has shown to have more strength than bigger opponents compared to Liv Morgan when she constricts on the ground with a Kirafuda clutch. Yet Liv is somehow able to turn all that around like it was nothing. That and Shayna clearly pushed herself up to. You know, I eventually expected the long-awaited feud between Shayna Baszler and Ronda Rousey, but to have it happen this quick and out of nowhere was very unexpected. WWE is really about expecting the unexpected, and it shows here. I'll even take off another 5 cents because this was the last thing I thought was going to happen mid-match. That's strange, I thought for sure that London was going to riot in the streets after LA Knight lost. What are your plans? Another Money in the Bank event, another moment where an interviewer tries to get the cash and plans out of the contract winner. And just like the other events, another moment where the contract winner is like, Bitch, please, you think I'm going to spoil my plans? Already predicting this for 2024. Matt Riddle must have seen Ronda Rousey's braids over the last few months and got inspired to use it as his own hairdo. Oh, come on, Matt Riddle too? He usually has Pyro explode from the ring post when he kicks off his flip-flops. This has been another edition of Non-Pyro Pyro, the Ryback Show. Previously on... Oh my god, I'm so tired right now. I'm starting to think Ludwig Kaiser is enjoying this a little too much with the amount of ease he put into the word the. I bet even Gunther behind him is like, bruh, can you hurry up already? I'm ready to fight. We invite you to enter the WWE. And I invite you to skip. Only the honky talk man and macho man Randy Savage. I made the same sin at Night of Champions, and thankfully my fans pitched in that there were other names involved too. But why is Michael Cole only mentioning Randy Savage and the honky talk man as the wrestlers who held the Intercontinental Championship longer than Gunther? By today, he surpassed Don Morocco, whose name was ignored. But there's also Pedro Morales, who's also being ignored. Also, why is Michael ignoring Pedro Morales having a longer intercontinental title reign than Gunther, but promoting the shit out of his WWF championship reign being passed by Roman Reigns? Which is also inaccurate, because Roman has been Universal Champion for a thousand days, not the WWE Champion. Also, also, I miss the simple CGI graphic days of championships being shown prior to title matches. Nowadays, you can't even see the full title because it's so up in your face and to the side. As much as possible. While trapped in the Kimura lock, Gunther tries to hit Matt Riddle's injured foot, but ends up spanking his own ass by accident. Or was it an accident? He is a good looking guy after all. And Riddle though. Riddle? Oh god, please don't tell me you're testing the possibility of Matt changing his last name from Riddle to Riddle here. I already don't like it. We didn't point out. Damn camera crews cutting away at the worst possible moment. Matt Riddle is finally taking control of his match with Gunther, but we're not going to see what he did to Gunther, because looking at the audience is much more important. Here's a guy you would not want to walk into in a pub and get in a fight with. To be fair, would you want to get into a pub and fight anybody, Michael Cole? I'm just saying, that was a dumb comment. Former tag team champion. Matt Riddle, a guy who's had his ankle attacked by Imperium over the last couple of weeks, is able to hop on it with his entire body weight without so much as a flinch or a buckle. Trying to strip off that protection. Well, somebody must have watched Brock Lesnar's Hell in a Cell match with The Undertaker over 20 years ago. Forward to calling matches. Alright, that was actually smart and impressive on the part of Matt Riddle. Uses his non-injured leg to kick Gunther off of him multiple times. Riddle looks to roll through, covering a kick at one. I've put in sins over the years for commentators saying a kick out at one was actually a kick out at two. And now I place a sin for Michael Cole saying a kick out at two was actually a kick out at one. We've gone both ways on this series now, but just can't seem to meet in the middle here. Ouch, Matt Riddle just landed awkwardly on the injured ankle from the floating bro, and even his other leg landed on the ankle too. He must be in extreme pain here. Wait, what? He's not in any sort of pain whatsoever? After all that punishment and even landing on the injury from high in the air? Alright, that's some major bullshit right there. Meanwhile, on this far side of the arena, for once I'm saying it in my terrible British accent in an actual British environment. To Riddle, Riddle again, look it up. BULLSHIT! Submission! 
Wow, you gotta hand it to Gunther. Over one year as the Intercontinental Champion and he still finds ways to annihilate his opponents. That was awesome. Drew McIntyre's the internet are a bunch of gullible freaks for actually being stupid enough to think I was angry with WWE face. But damn, I gotta take off another five cents because Money in the Bank is on a major roll with these surprises and shocking moments. Didn't expect Drew McIntyre to show up and confront Gunther, but it makes sense given the last time we saw him. And here we go. <laughs> Gunther was actually stupid enough to think that he could shove Drew McIntyre without the latter retaliating in any sort of way. At that rate, he absolutely deserves to get his ass kicked and even lose his title to Drew. Title theft. Huh. That's weird. I could have sworn that every single news source, even the most reliable ones, were telling us like they were on their deathbed that Cody Rhodes vs. Dominic Mysterio was going to be the main event of tonight's show. They were so keen on being right and are probably making the, uh, I think the plans changed excuses as the WWE once again shoves massive L's down their throats. It's always funny to laugh at when that happens. At where this story began. Cody Rhodes came out for a promo, got interrupted by Dominic Mysterio and Rhea Ripley, and that's how we got to this point. No need for a previously on package, but we're gonna get one anyway. Even after getting a white strap version of the WWE World Heavyweight Championship, Rhea Ripley sadly has been a terrible women's champion. When she's not fighting against Natalia, she's always bailing out Dominic Mysterio, and it's so irritating for all the wrong reasons. After that epic clash with Charlotte Flair at WrestleMania 39, what the fuck happened? <laughs> Cody Rhodes too? Come on! Although those five sins I just added are being retracted because I just can't stop watching this amazing entrance. The UK crowd was no doubt the best crowd for Cody Rhodes' entrance. And people actually thought Cody was buried after WrestleMania. <laughs> Imagine. Oh, now Cody Rhodes has pyro? Bet WWE didn't realize until now that they could have just done that for everybody else. Brock Lesnar! Booing and cheering dick measuring contest, it seems. Keep in mind, we don't want this event to go into major overtime, which it ends up doing anyway. Cody Rhodes, in the oh. catches Cody, with the Cody Rhodes takes one punch from Dominic Mysterio and briefly goes back to his dashing days when he got so sensitive about his face being punched. Over the last month, Cody Rhodes has been wrestling with the arm that got broken by Brock Lesnar, but the moment he reveals that his arm is fully healed up, the cameras completely ignore it, causing a casual reveal. Gosh darn it, production crew! And they actually told us that back at Night of Champions, which explained why Cody was able to supernaturally use his broken arm in the match of Brock Lesnar. We just didn't want to reveal that until right now. Uh, I don't think anyone's ever asked for Dominic Mysterio's autograph. There are endless pictures and video proof that combat what Michael Cole said about fans not ever wanting Dominic Mysterio's autograph, but go on. Punch Rhea Ripley! It'll probably give her actual competition compared to what she's sadly been given post-WrestleMania. Plus, she's literally asking for it. Oh, Dom is a wanker song. Very catchy, very funny, and worthy of a sit removal, so there you go. The entire existence of the United Kingdom crowd. Guarantee your hearts just skipped a beat because you thought I was putting a sin for that. No worries, I'm removing 10 sins for everything they do throughout the night because it's so fucking entertaining. More international pay-per-views, please. I can't be the only one who felt that the way Cody Rhodes won his match with Dominic Mysterio was anticlimactic, right? Seemed very simple, and aside from a couple distractions by Rhea Ripley, it felt way too easy. What a shame. Rhea Ripley be like, hurry dumb, we gotta get the hell out of this building because the women's Money in the Bank ladder match is up next, and I'm not gonna risk getting cashed in the same night the briefcase is won. Chop chop dum dum. I mean, come on, you're lying to me if you're telling me that you saw this coming at all. John Cena making a sudden appearance in London tonight at Money in the Bank was so amazing. Another five cents off because once again, this pay-per-view is on a major roll. I'm used to hearing you sing John Cena sucks. Uh, John, they actually were singing John Cena sucks during your entrance. I could hear it very well. What the hell took us so long? Oh, I see it. In between appearances in WWE and making Fast and Furious movies, John Cena on his downtime portrays the WWE Center. And now I challenge him for the Sinner's right at WrestleMania 40. Let's do this. They think this is a hostile environment. Man, who would have thought that John Cena would make a shocking appearance tonight just to roast the shit out of Vince McMahon? I'm here for it, respectively. WrestleMania to London. Oh yeah, that reaction is absolutely priceless. The idea of WrestleMania in London has been an ongoing desire for years. And even if it doesn't happen anytime soon, that reaction just proves it's a fantastic idea. I'll only take off one sin though, because this didn't make any promises. It gave a great reaction, but was mostly a tease to a possible future instead of a confirmed future. 
Guaranteed the moment Grayson Waller showed up, John Cena got flashbacks to his encounter with Austin Theory and thought to himself, Ah oh, shit, another one? I have nothing but the most respect for you. Heel wrestler interrupts to tell a legend that they respect him very much, only to belittle them with insults later cliche. No one cares what's trending, and most importantly, no one cares what's trending number one in the United States while in the United Kingdom. Somewhere like Australia. Here's a better idea. What if we got WrestleMania to go to London one year and Australia the next? Why compete over who gets it? With both, that opens more possibilities. Also, this segment goes on way too long and is a huge reason why the show ended up being four hours in length. I'm honestly surprised John Cena waited nearly 10 whole minutes before he finally kicked Grayson Waller's ass. Even the crowd is egging on John Cena to kick Grayson Waller's ass out of boredom. What's worse is this segment goes nowhere, not even to SummerSlam, I think. Also, no joke, it takes about two minutes just for Grayson to get to the point of hosting his talk show with John Cena as his guest at WrestleMania in Australia. Damn, these days attacking John Cena is easy. That's when you know the age has crept up to John. So sad. Climb the ladder. WWE plays an entire video package explaining the rules of the Money in the Bank ladder match as if we didn't already see this match an hour ago. I'm not entirely sure, but I feel like the women's match doesn't exactly have different rules from the men's. What, did WWE hire the creators of Sharknado to design the CGI for these ladders? Because holy shit, that looks terribly made. Representing the Judgment Day! Control. Based off what Samantha said, I'm assuming that Io Sky is the lone member of Damage Control remaining. Dakota Kai is out with an injury, and Bailey has joined up with the Judgment Day. Zelina Vega wears a mask for her entrance, only to remove it almost immediately. I can only assume that she couldn't see shit in the mask, and knew that there was a left turn required to make it to the ring, thus didn't want to risk running into the barricade. I'm actually going to take a sin off here. While Trish Stratus hasn't exactly done her best in this new heel role, the fact that she's here for more than a one-off match is actually awesome. And she can still hold her own, so this absolutely deserves praise. Money in the contract ladder match. Money in the contract ladder match? I presume this is now a different match, where the winner gets a million dollars in the briefcase instead of a title opportunity of their choice. Not gonna lie, that sounds like an actual money in the bank ladder match. Going to, uh... Bailey was watching Zelina Vega the entire time and could have countered and moved out of the way at any moment. What was Zelina even waiting for? Eo Sky moved carefully so as to not cause the ladder to fall over and hit the crowd, and as a result, the impact looked very lackluster. It's understandable to stop fans from getting hurt, but I would have suggested turning the ladder the other direction so that it could at least fall over on the walkway so the shot can look good too. It is somehow impossible for Zelina Vega to simply push the ladder off of her or even slightly lift it so she can roll out. <laughs> what? Well done, Trish. You flipped onto the ladder and caused yourself to get stuck on it. Good luck trying to get out of that. Second ladder match in a row with the first ladder introduced is too small to reach the prize. And it's even worse in this scenario because the majority of the women are much shorter than the men who brought that ladder in earlier tonight. The two teams have been working Back in Bailey's Hugger days, that song was catchy and entertaining. These days, after she ended that in 2019, it's very annoying, not just to the heel. Zelina though, sends Eos. Gotta commend both Zelina Vega and Eos Sky in making that Hurricane Rana look great despite Zelina's leg getting caught in the wrong position on the landing. Protecting your opponent while also making the move look good is how it's done. The usage of the disarmor through the steps of the ladder was a nice and creative move on the part of Becky Lynch. Another sin off. Now. Sense. Well, it was looking good, and then whatever that was happened. I gotta keep my hopes low, because there's always a sin around the corner to almost every sin removal. The Trish Stratus to make some his is Trish Stratus getting stopped by an invisible ghost? Or did John Cena return to the ring just to troll with her? A version of the Trish Kick. That move is called the Chick Kick, you moron. The there it is. Been waiting for Eo Sky's inevitable moonsault from near the top of the ladder. And I won't lie, the shot of the Money in the Bank briefcase right beside Eo as she jumps made it all the more badass. I'll take out three cents here. Trish is gonna win this thing. Why would you say that? Have you not learned from all the other times you prematurely celebrated a victory that ends up never happening? Trish has seen a ghost. Is it the same ghost that kept tripping her several times when she tried to ascend the ladder throughout this match? Becky off the ladder! Becky off the- Uh, what was that? Was Becky Lynch supposed to be countered by Zoe Stark? Or was Zoe supposed to be hit with a double axe handle? Either way, it led to this awkward miscommunication and adds another sin to the counter. No Sky launches herself off the top rope! And another botch. I'm pretty sure Zelina Vega was supposed to move out of the way from Yosuke's leg drop. Or was that a coup de grace? From the top rope. Unfortunately, she was in a bad position and ended up getting hit with it. 
and when you get hit by something you were originally supposed to counter, you roll with it. You don't pretend that it didn't affect you. Chris replacing Lita! Which, by the way, everyone else has completely forgotten about until Michael Cole brought it up. I bet even Lita herself forgot that Trish Stratus attacked her backstage prior to revealing her new villainous demeanor. Eat this! Eat this! Eat this! Well, I guess it wouldn't be a ladder smash without a ladder bridge between something. Usually the ring apron and barricade. I know, I didn't mention that earlier. That's why I'm doing it now. A stratisfaction that absolutely did no damage to Bailey due to the fact that the ladder was already level with her face before the collision. You know, one of these days, I'd like to see some sort of video where crew members who set up the ring look at each other and say, let's put these random pair of handcuffs under the ring and see if anyone is going to notice or use them. Bet you $20. Fight out. Zoe was not able Becky Lynch manages to fight out from getting handcuffed to the turnbuckle, yet she does everything in her power to not punch Trish and Zoe with her new handcuff weapon. Trish said over. London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down. Less of a manhandle slam, and more of a Trish fell backward without once getting lifted off the ground. Oh my God. Thank God that Zoe Stark did not get her head lodged into the ladder from that code red, otherwise this would have ended with severe consequences. But because it didn't, I will grant another 5 cents off the counter for a breathtaking moment in this ladder match. The one thing that irritated me about this moment is Io Sky could have easily just climbed the ladder below the briefcase and ignored the damaged ladder on the ground. Yet she spends a great deal of time getting that ladder out of the ring, just so others can get in the ring and stop her. Bailey just cost her team After this, Io Sky still chooses to team with Bailey for a while. While it is every woman for herself, let's be honest. Damage control has been on the way out the door for months, and this should have been Io's breaking point. But it's not. Yet. She had no idea that- Wade Barrett should probably realize that being a heel commentator doesn't mean you should be clueless to what's actually going on. Io Scott delivered one of the most creative ways of winning the Money in the Bank ladder match by handcuffing Becky Lynch to Bailey through the ladder and forcing them to watch her ascend to the top and unhook the prize. Nothing's more humiliating than being forced to watch your opponent win and there's nothing you can do about it. Another 5 cents off the counter. Boy, this is yet another long video. Hope you're still here with me. Previously on Money in the Bank. We already saw this almost two hours ago. What's this going to do? You took everything from me. And it took me literally seven years before I decided to kick your ass about it, even after the multiple opportunities that presented itself. Also, Finn Balor channeling his inner Scarlet Witch in the hopes that defeating Seth Rollins will work out like beating Thanos. Torn bicep tendon champion for 22 hours. You were left in my face. None of that matters to me. Wait a minute. So, Finn Balor just said that the injury being forced to relinquish his title and Seth Rollins laughing at him mean nothing to him? And then he said what does matter to him is... Vengeance for the injury being forced to relinquish his title when Seth Rollins laughing at him? Boy, this is more awkward when you actually stop and think about it. Also, if Seth Rollins being on top as world champion meant so much to Finn Balor, then where was he in 2019 when Seth dominated practically the whole year as the Universal Champion? Was it just because both men were good guys? You made me bitter. But I thought the injury being forced to relinquish your title when Seth Rollins laughing at you didn't matter anymore. Also, Finn Balor didn't seem to be bitter until recently. So again, I ask, where the hell was all this after he came back from his injury? Why didn't he immediately go after Seth Rollins in retaliation if he's been so bitter all these years? During the buildup, Seth Rollins demanded that the Finn Balor who beat him at SummerSlam be his opponent tonight at Money in the Bank. So, wouldn't it make more sense for Finn to unleash his inner demon, since that's who beat Seth all those years ago? Finn's not actually posing here, he's just making sure he's not running into the walls because he can't see shit underneath that mask. Man, Seth Rollins has been over many times throughout his career, but this crowd is making his entrance more exciting to watch with a perfect synchronization. I'd like to talk about, eventually... Michael Cole is hilarious. Knowing full well the audience is going to be singing Seth's music for the next five minutes, he remarks that eventually he'll talk about something. Imagine if he forgets what he was going to say because of this going on way too long. Still, funny comment. Although I'll place another sin because the singing goes on for the longest time. The singing itself ain't the problem, it's the lack of action. They can still sing while Seth and Finn begin their match. Who designed Seth's tape on his ribs, Triple H? Ear pulling. Think maybe Seth is trying to rip Finn's ears out of his head because he's sick of hearing the audience singing along to Seth's music all the time? Helping hand in a creepy manner? Repeatedly. Honestly, if Finn Balor wants to escape from another buckle bomb, perhaps he should be elbowing anything except for his own hand, as you can see here. Alan, wait for this. When you think about it, even if Finn did not move out of the way, Seth was not even aiming properly and would have missed him completely with the curb stomp. 
What, did he go to the Stormtrooper Academy of learning how to aim or something? To by set looking for a pedigree! But making sure to grab Finn's ass first because he secretly finds him attractive. Becky Lynch backstage might be fuming. Watch Seth's arms, arms. arms, watch his arms! Okay, okay, okay! I'm watching Seth's arms crossing on his chest! Jesus, what's with the desperate reminders? Seth Rollins has grown to a level of bitterness that- Wade Barrett confusing Finn Balor with Seth Rollins. This could be it. We might be in some crazy multiverse where Seth is the one bitter while Finn is the one with a success. Being reckless in Copy Sing Infringement. He might potentially want to end the career. No way, Wade. Finn Balor may want to cost Seth Rollins his career? That's just fucking unheard of, man! Balor measuring his man. Well, guess we're even now. First Wade Barrett confused Finn with Seth, and now Michael Cole confused Seth with Finn. It's been a long night, folks. For the championship and a Are you serious right now? Seth went through punishment for almost 10 minutes, but then suddenly kicks out at one? After several pins ending in two and having his injured ribs targeted? Nah, not believable. And there's the buckle bomb! What I'm honestly surprised at is Finn Balor never once tried to hit the buckle bomb on Seth Rollins into the barricade as a way of replicating what happened to him seven years ago. He was bitter all this time and wanted revenge, but didn't think about doing the one thing that caused his need for revenge in the first place. Missed opportunity. Buckle ball, Rollins! Try to go! Rolls out of harm's- Wow. For someone who suffered a lot of punishment, landed injured ribs first onto Finn's knees, and then took a drop kick into the corner, Seth Rollins recovered from all of that within five seconds. What kind of supernatural powers does he possess? Shoulders down to steal the championship! Commentator stupidly refers to a roll-up as stealing the victory cliche. At least Finn's not grabbing the tights or anything. Seth Rollins cops a feel. Damian Priest be like, sorry I'm late. For whatever reason, Rhea Ripley freaked out at the sight of me holding this briefcase, and I spent the last 10 minutes calming her down and telling her that I'm not cashing in on her world championship. Did the same thing Priest is doing! Technically, Seth Rollins ran a freaking marathon down to the ring to cash in his contract. Plus, how do you know Damian Priest is going to cash in right now? I can understand the anxiety Seth Rollins must be going through right now, but, um, he's kinda causing Finn Balor to recover from the onslaught while Damian Priest has done literally nothing. At this rate, cash in or not, Seth deserves to lose his championship. There was already a chair set up to sit on. Guess Damien just wanted to do that dramatic opening of the seat. Intimidation by chair. Paid for by Ow, that hurt my gut very bad, despite not even connected with the corner of the table. Oh, the agony. No. Just fucking no. I gotta throw in 20 sins for this, because throughout the entire buildup, Finn Balor hit so many coup de grasses on Seth Rollins outside the ring, causing injured ribs. Those injured ribs were targeted several times throughout this match, and now Finn just hit two more coup de grasses outside the ring, which would hurt more than in the ring. But because Finn looked away for a few seconds, Seth Rollins miraculously healed from all of that?! SEVERE BULLSHIT! Also, all Damien did was stand up from his seat and walk forward. If I were Finn, I'd be like, oh shit, he wants to cash in. Well, better finish off Seth so we can fight next. The distraction tactic was kinda lame. About four minutes of an Edge video package because he is set to be part of Grayson Waller's talk show because... reasons? The show has already gone past three hours, but sure, we totally have time for a random interview with Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens that does nothing for the show because we're sorry we couldn't fit them on the match card tonight. What? And then Kevin Owens accidentally drops the Raw and SmackDown tag team titles, causing concussions to those below him. Either that, or someone gets free titles. That's a little more personal for me. It's a Kevin Owens, why do I gotta keep hearing about Sami Zayn's obsession with the Bloodline face? And I know that's the look on his face because he's literally said it too. Sami's just gotta let them go. The crowd can't even stay in sync to Sami Zayn's music, but can be in perfect sync to everything else they've sung tonight. And some people actually thought this Bloodline storyline was getting stale. I'm taking off 10 cents for one of the best video packages leading into a main event that I've ever seen. The music, the drama, the moments. Holy shit, this is everything and really gets you excited for the incoming Civil War. Let's do this. Send out this tweet. You know, at first I thought WWE had Solo Sokoa make his entrance while the video package was going on and was about to hurl a bunch of sins for the disrespect but then realized WWE trolled me by playing the music so that we can see Roman Reigns' tweet. Also, why are they playing Solo Sokoa's music over a Roman Reigns tweet, instead of Roman's own theme itself? Last I checked, Solo doesn't operate the Tribal Chief's Twitter. Right? Not gonna lie, the audience singing along to the Usos' music further added into how awesome it is, and gets you more pumped for this match, too. I love the UK crowds. 
Usos have dug themselves a hole. What the show did not need is Wade Barrett being the heel ass kissing commentator. What's honestly wrong with having a neutral commentary team for once? They can still be entertaining. Just give it a shot already. Fuck. Something that doesn't make sense here is Roman Reigns still having Paul Heyman carry the WWE and Universal Championships, despite the fact that he has an undisputed championship around his waist. What, is he now holding three different championships? Seriously, either keep the two titles or accept the new one and drop the others. Roman Reigns had to walk halfway down the ramp and even turn just to be in perfect positioning for his pyrotechnics. And even then, he still wasn't in the perfect position. Also, even with the quick walk to the ring just to align himself with the pyro, Roman Reigns still manages to somehow have his entrance go on for five minutes. Civil one would think that since this match is designated as a civil war, it would be contested under no holds barred rules and tornado tag rules. But for something that's called a civil war, there's less war and more civil. This match really should have been so uncivilized. Sure, maybe they should back it up. Or, or, and hear me out on this one, you let these teams go to war on each other. You know, the title of this match. Also, between entrances, ring introductions, and non-stop staring contests, it actually takes about 15 minutes before any sort of action takes place in the Civil War. Two minutes of nothing. And here we go, underway. Well, we were underway, but after Jimmy Uso took one single shove from Solo Sokoa, we're gonna stop and wait for another two minutes. Then we're gonna try again, and hope that Solo doesn't shove away his opponent, because that spells the end for physical conflict. <laughs> this crowd, man. This fucking crowd. The UK crowd could chant sinning wanker to me, and I would still remove a sin for it. Not that I'd recommend it, please don't do that. I up and solo this with a slam. Okay, seriously, can we please not regroup after every minor thing that happens? Otherwise, we're gonna be here for another four hours. See, even Roman Reigns is laughing at the lack of action going on in this match that's supposed to be a war. I can do this all day, guys. Actually, I've been doing this all day. Base and a kick from That's why the Usos are the greatest tag team. Michael Cole is praising the Usos for cheating behind the referee's back, but whenever it's conveniently the bad guys doing it, Michael has a problem with it. Hypocrisy. The world. <laughs> that weird laugh from Wade Barrett. If that was Roman and Solo who did that? Cheating, right? Well, yes, Wade Barrett has been an ass kisser toward the heels. In this moment, he would be great at CinemaSense 2 expansion for calling out Michael Cole's hypocrisy. Thank you for adding that sin in for me, Wade. And Michael Cole conveniently has nothing to say about that call out. No! Roman Reigns only stopped Solo Sokoa from going after Jey Uso because the momentum in this match was about to pick up and he wanted to stop it completely. Dick. Also, no joke, over one damn minute of Solo Sokoa approaching Roman Reigns just to tag him into the match. It doesn't take a whole minute just to tag someone in. Also, also, another two to three minutes of no war in this civil match. Now that I labeled it as that, it makes more sense to be doing almost nothing for 10 straight minutes. Still worth a sin, though. I don't know why, but this referee is so funny because he still has enough respect to call Roman Reigns sir, despite being threatened by him and asserting authority as the referee in the match. Hey, don't you hit me, sir. Funny stuff. By declaring that beating down Jey Uso is easy, Roman Reigns ended up forgetting that Jey wasn't easy to beat in 2020 and jinxed his own momentum. And now Jimmy and Jay went for Roman Reigns quickly got out of a double super kick attempt, likely because he knew it was going to look horrible due to Jimmy Uso getting a head start over Jay. The tribal chief is disappointed by your lack of coordination. One's gotta wonder if Paul Heyman holding all three of Roman's championships is his daily workout routine, or if he's suffering from under the weight of all that gold. My tribal chief, why do I always have to carry this shit everywhere? Do you want your sons at his table? Do you also want every last person watching this worldwide to hear every word of our not-so-private conversation? <laughs> I don't know why, but this referee is stealing the show with his looks. His reaction to the fans chanting tribal bitch is just priceless. Like, oh fuck, now he's gonna be even more pissed. I'm loving this. Oh, and Roman Ow! Massive punch! Somersaulting time! Whee! Solo could end the match right now. Great idea, Wade. Solo Sokoa could end the match right now. One problem, he's not ending the match right now! I'm not saying I want to end it quickly. I'm just saying it's poor strategy to delay like this, as we've seen over the years. If you hate Roman Reigns, stand up, huh? Hey! Why are you guys watching this video standing up? Sit your ass down and acknowledge your- Ah, what the hell, it's a funny chant and the UK crowd deserves more praise for their sense of humor. England's the worst, the dumbest place of all time! Footage of Vince McMahon rejecting the idea of WrestleMania taking place in London due to the insane crowd somehow makes its way into this Money the Bank pay-per-view event. 
narcissist and he expects people to Earlier, the crowd was singing, if you hate Roman Reigns, stand up, and he yelled at them to sit their asses down. So in response, the crowd is singing, if you hate Roman Reigns, sit down. I don't think this place is the dumbest of all time. This is the greatest crowd of all time. Fuck it, remove 10 sins from the counter. Solo Sokoa wasting precious time posing up a storm when he could be, I don't know, ramming into Jimmy Uso who's recovering in the corner. A hostile environment. Michael Cole reconfirming John Cena's concerns earlier tonight about the crowd being too hostile for WrestleMania, but once again referring to them as a hostile environment. The man's been champion for 1,000. And aside from a single defense at a non-televised house show, Roman Reigns hasn't even defended his championship since WrestleMania 39. He's shown up and only missed one pay-per-view since then, but is yet to defend. For that, I gotta give 50 cents, because that's worse than simply being absent. And Roman with forearm in the face, kick out at two. Why is Roman Reigns getting frustrated with the referee? Jimmy Uso kicked out of a simple big boot, a move that's never won Roman a match in the 11 years he's been in WWE. It's not like he kicked out of a spear or Superman punch. The legs does. He's about an arm. Doesn't that technically count as Jimmy Uso tapping out to Roman Reigns since his hand tapped them out at least three times? Jimmy should consider himself lucky that the referee was looking at Jay Uso in the corner and missed it. Oh boy, and now the rumors of a Rock vs. Jay Uso match are about to begin because Jay connected the punches like the Rock normally did. Jay Uso making the same mistake that Solo Sokoa did earlier by posing up a storm instead of ramming into his opponent. Daddy Rikishi would be proud! Proud, but also disappointed. Let's not forget that Solo Sokoa is also Rikishi's son, and even though Solo's been an asshole with Roman Reigns, it would still sting for him. Wait a minute, Solo Sokoa was not hit for a good 20 seconds, yet did not counter the first attack but magically recovered from it almost immediately to prevent it a second time? What kind of logic is that supposed to be? You can tell when Roman Reigns is going to counter his opponent simply because the camera stayed zoomed in on Jey Uso the whole time and keeping Roman off screen. Double copyright infringement, but also it would have been better if Michael Cole didn't alert us to the tag because then it'd be a surprise to us watching at home with the Usos countered Roman spear with their own. All wrestlers slowly get to their feet and prepare to brawl with one another after a long time has passed in the match cliche. Honestly, with this sequence, we could have called this match the good, the bad, and the bloody. Just shut up now! After two years of trying to get the fans to shut up since they returned from the pandemic, how the hell does Roman Reigns not realize this attempt is futile? Well, because you asked that question out loud, I'm just gonna assume that Jimmy Uso will not pull off the impossible. Michael Cohen is constant jinxing of wrestlers during matches. I feel like he's doing this on purpose by now. Jimmy trying to set Good thing that Jimmy Uso is still conscious after the referee drops his arm on the first attempt, but this reminds me, why the fuck did the referees call for the bell after an arm drops one time instead of the traditional three times? They're just like the IWC, they give up too easily. <laughs> Well, it's a Roman Reigns match, so we gotta add in the referee gets knocked over at the crucial point of the match cliche. Also, after all these years of getting knocked out during Roman's matches, how are the referees not impervious to pain by now? Or at least wearing a suit of armor knowing full well what's about to happen when they officiate a Roman Reigns match. Damn it, not again! It takes over three and a half hours for Michael Cole's emotion and dedication to actually show up tonight. Where have you been? Arguing with Wade Barrett? Who counted to ten? The audience, they don't matter! Jesus Christ, shut the fuck up! Spike and spear! One thing I gotta admit is, despite the situation we're in, a Samoan spike and spear combination is actually one of the most badass double team moves for a tag team. If Roman Reigns and Solo Sokoa continue to team after this, they should totally use that as their finisher. I know we're trying to replicate the moment from WrestleMania 37 when Edge and Daniel Bryan got stacked and pinned by Roman Reigns, but that was a triple threat match. In a tag team match, it's not legal to pin both opponents at the same time because Jay is legal, but Jimmy is not. If anything, after recovering, the referee should be saying he can't count because there's an illegal competitor interfering. Also, if this is legal, why do pinfalls stop when someone else hits them? This really causes a defiant logic if you think about it. Well, holy fucking shit! The crowd went from chanting bullshit and being almost silent to cheering louder than before on the kickout. After years of Roman Reigns winning in similar ways, the crowd was expecting the match to end, which made the kickout even better. Without a doubt, one of the coolest moments of this match. Here are 15 sins off. Even though he doesn't attack Roman right here, you can see in Solo's eyes that even he has had enough of the tribal chief. The end is near. It's crystal clear. Wait, what? Solo Sokoa makes sure to put Jimmy Uso in the I'm obviously going to move out of the way position on the announce table before doing anything. What a good brother. Sacrificing himself just so his older bro can be saved. Spare! 
I won't lie, I actually thought the match was over when Roman Reigns hit that final spear, especially after everything Jey Uso was put through in that Samoan Spike spear combo, so to see that kick out and the crowd's reaction was insane. What an unforgettable night. But also, since I'm a sinner and I saw the low blow, I gotta do my job because Jey Uso was a dick to Roman's reigns. Well, holla motherfucking luya! This was absolutely the most perfect way to culminate the Bloodline Civil War. I've been saying for the longest time on other videos that Jey Uso had to be the one to pin Roman Reigns based off everything they've been through with that storyline. It all came true on this night, and I throw away 100 sins for it. Well fucking deserved. But finally, the last thing I'll add is the fact that it's unfortunate that the setup is small, which means we can't fire off any pyrotechnics as a celebration for Roman Reigns eating a pinfall for the first time in over three and a half years. I'm just saying, they fired Pyro as a celebration for Mustafa Ali winning a battle royal one time, so this is the most perfect opportunity for a pyrotechnic celebration. Finally, I'm done with this long video. Good night, everybody.